Revelation 10. I'll begin reading at verse 1. Read to the end of the chapter and get into Revelation chapter 10. Let's begin reading together at uh, verse 1. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, Seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea, and the things that are in it, that there should be no delay, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. He said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. He said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. What we have now, and let me give to you some very basic things related to this passage. What we have here is what is called a, a parenthetical section. This is a section that starts in chapter 10 and goes into chapter 11, verse 14. And uh, this section that we're looking at is not necessarily in what would be called chronological sequence. But what it does is it's giving us some insight into how to understand the prophetic scenario that we have here in the book of Revelation. And so this is a parenthesis, if you will. What we have here, and we'll begin by looking at verses 1 through 3, is notice how he says, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven. So let me just lay a basic foundation as we move into this. I'll begin by saying that throughout the book, John has used the words, I saw, to reveal a new vision that he's received. We saw that already in chapter 4, verse 1, and he used that same formula in chapter 7, verse 1, as well as chapter 7, Verse 9, so this is the way that he speaks concerning revealing something new that he's received. Here we have him speaking about, now notice, another mighty angel. Now I'm going to give to you something here. You know, I, I, I could actually omit doing this as fully as I'm going to, but just so that I can give you something more thorough, uh, what we have here is uh, is is a a picture of either an angel or, or Jesus. There are those who believe that what we see here is actually a description of Jesus, and I'll show you that. And there are others that would state, no, this is really a, a description of, uh, of, of Jesus or that angel. So let's look at it. Notice there are those who say this is, appears to be Jesus, and, that's, and the reason they believe that is because notice he has what would be called symbols of authority. For example, he is clothed with a cloud. When he's describing this angel, notice it says here that he is clothed with a cloud. Well, when you look in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, Daniel said, I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So in Daniel 7, 13, what you have is a picture of Messiah, and he is there coming with clouds, and therefore clouds can be associated with Messiah. This angel is associated with Messiah, or clouds, rather. In Mark 13, 26, Jesus said, Then shall you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So one, the symbols of authority include first a cloud. A cloud can be um, 
recognized as being associated with Messiah. So there are those who say, well, this angel is Jesus. A second reason they would say that is because he has a rainbow. There's a rainbow on his head. Now, when you look in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 12 through 15, a rainbow is a symbol of mercy in the midst of judgment. In Genesis 9, 12 through 15, God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So he has a rainbow. A rainbow is a symbol of mercy in the midst of judgment, often associated with Messiah. A third thing, his face is like the sun. Now, when it uses a picture, his face is like the sun, that would be evidencing the fact that he has come from the presence of God. In Exodus 34, 29, it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses knew not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And so this, this face like the sun is evidence of being in the presence of God, which some would say Messiah obviously is in the presence of God. And then fourth, his feet are like pillars of fire. Fire in scripture is often used as a symbol for judgment. Someone wrote, it all began in Genesis. Adam and Eve were barred from the tree of life by a flaming sword which turned every way, Genesis 3.24. Next, the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire, Genesis 19.24. In Egypt, there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, Exodus 9.24. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord, and there went out fire from the Lord and consumed or devoured them, Leviticus chapter 10. In Korah's uprising, a fire from the Lord and consumed them is found in Numbers 16.35. Elijah prayed fire down from heaven, 1 Kings 1, 10, and 12. And Malachi predicted a future day of burning in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. And so fire is associated with judgment. So he's clothed with a cloud. There's a rainbow upon his head. His face is like the sun. His feet are like pillars of fire. Therefore, there are those who would say, this is a picture of Messiah. Now notice in verse 2, he had a little book upon open in his hand. This little book perhaps represents his authority to execute judgment on earth. Remember in Revelation 5, 7, he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of whom he sat on the throne. But you also see a picture of his right foot being on the sea and his left foot on land. This would be a picture of God being sovereign over land and sea, and he's going to take it back from Satan. Now, Developing it a little bit further. The problem with saying that this angel is Jesus is someone would ask, why would Jesus be identified as a mighty angel? Well, in the Old Testament, Jesus appears of, as what is referred to as the angel of the Lord. You see that in Genesis 16 as well as Judges chapter 2. And so some would say, well, he's referred to as an angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. That is called, for those who take notes, when Jesus appears in what is called his pre-incarnate appearances, they are either called theophanies or Christophanies, which is manifestations prior to the incarnation. And so, with that said, there are those who would say that what we're looking at in chapter 10 is really Jesus. But I don't think so. So I gave you all of that for no reason at all. <laughs> there are others who would argue that this is a mighty angel. He's delegated with authority, but not the Lord Jesus. Why? Well, there are good reasons. One, Jesus never appears as an angel after the incarnation. He never does. Two, this angel is referred to as another angel. The word another in the Greek language is aloth. And the word Allah speaks of another of the same kind. Jesus Christ is not an angel. 
And so when it speaks here concerning another angel, this is speaking of an angel, and the kind of angel he is would be the kind of angel that we've already seen in the trumpet judgments, an angel. Third, he's revealed as coming down from heaven. But the second coming of Christ does not occur at this time. And then verse 6 tells us that this angel, now notice with me, swore by him who lives forever and ever, the one who created heaven. This angel swore by him who lives forever and ever. Well, Jesus is the one who created all things. And without him, nothing exists, nothing was made that has been made. He is the creator. And so Jesus Christ is, is an angel would be the one who is, who is uh, swearing by the one who created all things, but Jesus himself would not be doing that. And so I believe that what we have here is an angel. And so this angel that we see is a mighty and powerful angel, but he's an angel nonetheless. And so it describes the angel in verse 3 as crying out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when it speaks in that way, it's speaking of the volume of the cry. But it also can speak of the authority that is being exercised as he cries out. And notice it says, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, the seven thunders would be uttering their voices. It's a picture of judgment. The seven thunders represent the perfection of God's intervention in judgment upon the earth. And so judgment is coming. That's the whole picture here. In verse 4, it says, When the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. God does not reveal everything to man. I can go on for a while on this. I'm looking at the time. Jared taking so much of my time. Uh, <laughs> I want to share a couple things with you very briefly. The occult. The occult speaks of hidden knowledge. People who are involved in what is called occultism are those who are seeking hidden knowledge. You find in the Old Testament, you see also in the New Testament, and you see in ancient history what were called mystery religions or mystery cults. And there's a variety of them, of course, we don't know all of them. There's been so many through the history of man, but there are some major cults that have existed that were based on exposing mysteries, hidden things, that the only way you could know these hidden things is if you were part of their system. So you had to be initiated and indoctrinated in the occultic system in order for you to be able to get the revelation, whether it be through oracles, whether it would be through... Um, you know, throwing uh, chicken bones or, or, um, or chicken entrails or whatever. I mean, there were a variety of means that people would use to try and discern future. It's called occultism, and to this day we have it. There are various religious systems on the face of the earth that, that you may be familiar with that, that have these kinds of practices in them, and they're not, you know, someplace out in some foreign land. They're here on the face of the United States. We have them here in California, Santeria, and, and various other cultic systems where there is an attempt to find or divine uh, the will of the God through a variety of sacrifices and blood offerings and you name it. I mean, those are things that, that some of you may be very familiar with. I have a friend of mine who was a priest in Santeria for a long time. And he says it's a very dangerous occultic system. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of blood, a lot of violence. And so there are different systems, even to this day, that are attempting to find out what is called hidden knowledge. God forbids us pursuing that. Some people will do that by doing their, their horoscope. Some will go to palm readers. Some will get into Ouija boards. You know, do you know what Ouija means? Some of you know, but some of you don't. Ouija you know, we talk about Ouija boards, O-U-I-J-A. All that is is a combination of two words, yes, French and German. We in uh, 
French and Ja in German, and it's just the yes, yes board. That's what it is. How mysterious is that? I just. <laughs> but that's what Ouija is. Some of us didn't know it. It was a board game, but a lot of people really do believe in and use that to try and discern future events. What are they doing? They're trying to delve in to knowledge that has been withheld from them. And so they're trying to find a way to get to that knowledge. In the book of uh, Deuteronomy, in chapter 29, verse 29, we read, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. God in his word has revealed to you all you need to know. That's why you don't go outside of the word of God to try and determine the will of God. That's why you don't. The secret things belong to the Lord. There are things that he doesn't reveal to us. There are people in this room, probably all of us, at one time have done this. Man, when I see the Lord, I've got some questions to ask him. Anybody ever say that? Anybody? When I see the Lord, I've got some questions I'm going to be asking him. I'm going to ask him. Oh, really? I don't think so. One, when we see him as he is, you've got no questions. You've got no questions. His power and his glory and his holiness will cause us to shrink back if it were not for Jesus Christ who makes us able to stand. And two, then we shall know even as we are known, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. It will all be known to us. There will be no questions, only answers. But here on the face of the earth, God says there are secret things that belong to me that I'm not revealing to you. And so here in this passage in the book of Revelation, he wants to write down, and it says that in verse 4. He says, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, do not write them. So these things don't belong to us. They belong to uh, the one who heard it, and it's sealed. Now, in verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be no delay or there be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. And so lifting up his hand to heaven symbolizes his taking a vow. He does that in the name of the one who lives forever and ever. Notice the one who created all things. He does that in the name of God. What this is stressing is the fact that God is eternal and that God is all-powerful. And he says in verse 6, there will be delay no longer. In other words, when we were looking in chapter 6, verse 10, and the martyrs were asking the question, how long until you avenge us? Their prayer is now being answered. In verse 7, it says, In the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, that reveals the seventh trumpet judgment is about to come and is not, by the way, a single event, but it's going to cover some time. The seventh trumpet judgment actually rolls into and includes the bowl judgments that we'll be seeing later on. He speaks in verse 7 of the mystery of God, and it's going to be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. When it speaks of the mystery of God, the mystery he speaks of is the full manifestation of his divine power. It's speaking of the consummation of all things. That's about to happen. Satan no longer will have his way on the earth. God is moving to end his evil forever, and God is about to establish his kingdom. Now, as this is taking place in verse 8, the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter 
but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. He said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. A couple things here that I think are very important. One, he's saying, I want you to fully assimilate the word of God. Notice something. His word will be sweet to you, but it will also be bitter to you. His word is going to be sweet to you because you desire God to be honored. But his word will also be bitter to you because the future that awaits unbelievers is going to be painful. In ministry, I'll get real practical for a moment here. How do, you, how do I put it? If, if, you, if a person will teach the whole counsel of God, it's, it can be very difficult to do. I'm going to get personal, and I hope you don't think that I'm trying to, to draw attention to myself. I'm just trying to make it personal so that you can understand what I'm trying to say when I talk about bitter and sweet. Because this is what John is experiencing, the sweetness of the word of God, but the bitterness of its impact. When people reject God, it's painful. There have been times before I teach over the years, many times, that just before I come out, especially on Sundays, just before I come out, that I'll stand at the door there for a moment realizing that the message that has to be taught today, if I rightly divide the word, is going to be painful to some people. It's going to be painful. At first it surprised me, I have to be honest with you, at first it surprised me because I came from a time where, tr to me, truth was important. I want to hear truth. I came out of a religious system, I'll be honest with you, in my experience, the religious system I came out of didn't tell me the truth. Just didn't. Just didn't. I, I, I'll get personal, I'll give you a personal application to this. Um, I was about seven years old. I was in church, and the priest told everybody, um, if you want to take a vow to never drink, take a vow to never drink, and make a promise to God that you will never drink, he said, I want you to stand to your feet right now so I can pray for you. And so I'm a little boy, seven years old, and I'm saying, man, I want to serve God someday. I want to serve God. So I stood up at the age of seven. He kept looking at me. The priest kept looking at me. This is a very serious promise. Now, there's other people standing up. Not everybody, but there are other people. But he's looking right at me. And, then, then, and I just kept looking back at the priest. Because I want to be, I want to be, a person who knows God. And yeah, I, I, I won't drink. I'm seven years old. And he's looking at me. The very, you know, in this church, and, and he prayed for everybody that that they'll not drink. The same church had a festival, and they sold beer. Okay, they sold beer. And the first beer I ever tasted was when I was seven, after I took the vow. <laughs> and it was the beer I stole out of the icebox from the church. It's a true story. True story. We found, a, we found an icebox, opened it up. It was filled with beer after catechism. And we walked home drinking beer. I was seven years old, first time I ever drank. But I got beer from the church who had a priest who had people standing up saying that they're taking a vow to God not to drink. That was my hypocritical environment where you say one thing and then sell what you're forbidding later on for profit. That's what I thought religion was, saying one thing and doing another. 
having one person pray for you that you won't do something, when in reality he will sell you that which he's making you promise not to do. That's how I looked at religion. That's what I thought faith was. It's something that you put on once in a while and take off later on. It doesn't really impact. It doesn't really change. So that's why I went in the direction I did. Not the only reason. There are so many others, of course. But that was part of what made up my religious background. And so when I got saved, it was because I was hungry for truth. I'll take it a step further. And I won't take you into chapter 11 today because of Jared. You want to know God. You want to have a relationship with the Lord. And you want people to tell you the truth. And I have a friend who's telling me, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, David. You need to commit yourself to Jesus Christ. You're a sinner. And David, the religion that you're practicing, the religious faith that you hold to, hasn't set you free. And David, you need to come to faith in Christ, my friend would tell me. And he would quote scriptures. And I got angry because I was, I was raised like some of you. I wonder how many people were raised in the Catholic Church. Raise your hand, let me know. Good, por good portion of you. Good portion of you know exactly what I'm talking about, then don't you? I'm not condemning them. Just stating the facts. I went to see my parish priest. I said to him this. One of my friends is going to this Protestant church. And he keeps arguing with me and he's using the Bible. And I want some answers. Because I believe that I was raised in truth, I was telling him. I believe that. And I need to be helped so I can respond to the things he's saying. And my priest looks at me, I'll never forget how he leaned back in his easy chair and he crossed his legs and kind of relaxed. And he said, you know, I've tried Eastern mysticism. I've tra tried various religious beliefs. And I came back. So will you. That was his answer. And I looked at him and I thought, you know, now, you have to understand, and I'll go a little further. I was a doper. I was an alcoholic. But I wanted to know what truth is. And I went to whom I thought could give it to me. And when he did not give me anything, my friend was giving me Bible, and he gave me his experience. I walked out of that room at the age of 20. And I said, he doesn't have truth. If he had it, he'd have given it to me. He doesn't have truth. Now, I didn't come out with this instant, you know, manifestation of Jesus there shining and angels singing and trumpets blaring and uh, come to me. I just said, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. He doesn't have anything to offer me. And that's when I began to say, there must be something else out there that I'm just not getting. So I went to a church that had a guy who actually opened the book and taught out of it. It was called Calvary Chapel. And he talked as if Jesus was in the room. And he talked as if the Holy Spirit was a person and not just the silent partner of the Holy Trinity. And they sang songs that were alive and current and something that I could relate to. And the people who sat around me weren't judging me because I was barefooted and I had long hair. It just was an entirely different experience. And I sensed something there. I sensed something there that I hadn't sensed in the church I used to go to. I didn't know what it was, 
but there was something different about this place, and I knew it, but I didn't know what it was until a few months later when somebody through the gospel explained to me what it was. It's Jesus, it's his presence, it's his Holy Spirit, it's a love for God, it's salvation, it's faith, it's grace, it's the presence of the Lord. That's what I was experiencing, and I didn't know that. And so you, you have to understand, and, and there's a reason for me saying this, and, and it's this. I, I, I believe with all of my heart, my responsibility as your pastor, those of you who call me pastor, is this, to tell you the truth. That's my job, and I will not hold it back from you because it sets you free. That's why I do it. That's why. It would be easier for me to say things you want to hear every time. It's easy. Hey, you're beautiful. God loves you just the way you are. Go out to the bar afterwards, have a beer, talk about Jesus. It's cool. I can't do that. Why? Because I want you to be not just saved. I want you to be extraordinarily saved. I want you to experience God. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I say the truth. That's why I want you to know the truth, because Jesus said it will make you free. And that's how you're set free, to know the truth. And by the way, getting to the verse, <laughs> sweet and bitter. I stand at the door sometimes and I say, God, this is going to hurt somebody. say it because if I don't I don't honor God I'm not dividing the word if I'm hiding from you the whole counsel of God and sometimes it hurts it sometimes hurts it's some and you know you, you I, I, thank you for that that's encouraging but the bottom line is is it is a struggle I am just like anybody else when it comes to wanting people to love me just like anybody else I would like to make every one of you walk out of this room saying, gosh, I am so happy I went to church because I feel so good. But I discovered a long time ago that sometimes you hurt a little bit before you feel good. Sometimes my Lord has got to convict me so that I can turn from what's killing me. And when I turn from what's, turn, from what's killing me and hurting me and hurting others, he changes my life. He deepens me, strengthens me. His presence is with me. I learned what it means to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I learned to know that he will not leave me. He never forsakes me. He is with me always, even in the times that are difficult. And when the word of God goes out and John is saying, he's telling John, it's going to be bitter and it's going to be sweet. It's sweet because it's the revelation of God. It's bitter because of the effect it's going to have on those who reject him. Any minister worth his salt, any minister, any pastor, any minister of the gospel worth their salt is a person who wants to tell the truth because that is what God called us to do, even if it hurts the person listening. And it was not easy telling my dad you're going to hell. It was not easy telling my mom that. There were many conversations my mom and I had over the many years that she followed Jesus Christ where I sat down with her and she would get mad at me and there were times when my mom would slam her little hand on the table and yell at me because what I was teaching her, she didn't appreciate it. My mom was a little firecracker. <laughs> she really was. And she would get mad sometimes and she would yell and she would want to argue and I would sit there patiently with her. She's my mom. And she'd say things to me, and I'd let her, and I'd say, okay, that's enough. Now you need to be quiet, because this is what God's word says. So if you can do that with your own mom, you can do that with anybody. I promise you. I promise you. Because I loved that woman so much that I made a vow to God to only tell her the truth. And the truth came from the word of God. 
and it can be sweet to the taste. For those who are saved, God's word is sweet. But for those who are rejecting, it becomes bitter. And as John has these words that he's ingesting, assimilating, digesting, it's going to be sweet and it's going to be bitter. In Psalm 19, verses 9 and 10, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are sure, altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. God's word is sweet, but sometimes it leaves a bitter taste in those who are rejecting it. And this angel is telling him very clearly here, take and eat it, it'll make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Assimilate and absorb God's word. It will be sweet to you because you desire God to act and be honored. But it will be bitter to you because the future that awaits unbelievers will cause you pain. And indeed, and indeed, in a time when people are rejecting the Lord, those who love Jesus and share, and you know this when you share with your friends and family and they reject it, doesn't it cause you pain? It does. It brings tears to your eyes. Oh, that's good for you. It's, you know, and I'm glad you're changed. By the way, you needed to change. That's what my brother told me. You needed to change, man. You're messed up. But I don't. I'm fine. But you, you needed to change. And I learned a long time ago, and I'll give you one last thing, and this is practical for those who have ears to hear. I never cried until I got saved. That's the truth. I didn't cry until I got saved. And then I started crying for lost people, friends and family, people who don't know him. And you do cry for the lost. We've been indoors for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And when you go forth, Weeping, bearing precious seed, you shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. Learn to cry for the lost and watch what God will do in your life. Yes, it's sweet, but for those who reject it, it will leave a bitterness in your heart, a sorrow and a pain for the lost people. May we learn to cry for the lost.